uh, I joined the competition and we made a team and wrote a digital assistant for new students, basically telling them where in which building is going to be your uh, lecture, how do you get there by bike, by bus, automatically scheduling when to take it, how to be there, so making the life of a student easier. And uh, yeah, we did make second place at that competition. And uh, the first place was actually a small idea called Sona. Uh, but I was approached all the time by the founders of Sona to join that team. And after my company failed, I switched basically to Sona. Also took some of my teammates with me. And yeah, since then I've been like the first still remaining employee at Sona. So if it's a parking lot, it's installed at the parking lot on top of the street map. If it's in a parking housing, it's installed on the inside roofs of uh, each level of that parking house. And then the vision data is taken and evaluated on that computer directly with the neural network and of course also multiple neural networks and algorithms with pre and post processing. started in, in school when I was a kind of a problem student and my parents decided to initiate a robotics club at my school so to give me something to do and not to annoy the teachers. So without any further ado let's welcome Jonas Zagata. Certainly. Uh, and now let's let's talk about your uh, experience uh, specific to the the startup. And I want to ask you if given an opportunity, would you be willing to work for an established company in, in the future, or do you love working at a startup? I I, I kind of know where you're heading, but I want to yeah. So in Get reality, probably probably I won't. So that's, uh, I would be interested. I mean, I've worked in a corporate as a student TV, the corporation where my dad works. It's a big company. It's called DSpace. Maybe you've heard of it. It's an automation. They have some corporations even with FETH if you go into simulation science. Okay. And um, yeah, so, so I've worked there. It was interesting. It was also a very um, innovative company. Everybody was uh, using the in German do not the Z, so the, the personal pronoun to everybody, even the boss. Yeah. So you can have great environment and even a traditional company. And I would definitely try it. I just think I wouldn't last very long because I'm, as I said before, I'm, I think in a positive sense, a real pain in the ass. So if I think something, I think something, and then I'm, uh, I'm just going to, to uh, advocate for it and uh, not being quiet about it. And if there would be, and I think there definitely could be, a big company that values my moral standards, my way of working, I would definitely be working at a, at a big company. I mean, just imagine how much more money I could get compared to a startup. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing. I just yeah. haven't found the big corporate where I feel they have the same values as me. So essentially, uh, the thing that you uh, you value most is... Uh, the freedom to be, you know, yourself and the, the way you operate and it doesn't matter whether it's a big company or not. Of course, the advantage is with a big company is the high pay, right? And, yeah. and, and, and with a smaller pay, you would be contributing more. So probably a sense of contribution would definitely be more working at a startup. But ultimately what you, you prefer is, you know, being, you know, free to operate in your way, right? I would rather say agency because operate to free in my way. I'm also not at the startup. 
everybody who goes to a startup and expects that he can like all the time develop new and interesting things. It's just wrong. It's a lot of hard work, a lot yeah. of pain and little, uh, little pay. So if you see it on a, if you put it on a sheet of paper, a startup job is definitely worse. But from what I understand from psychological science, Mm -hmm. um, is that agency is having agency over your life, over what you do, is a main contributor to job satisfaction. What and do you mean by agency? I mean deciding how you do things, sometimes deciding what you do, and being involved and being heard. Like, of course, in a startup, even me as an executive, I cannot uh, go to the three founders uh, and say, I will just do this now and I don't care what you think. I have to discuss. I have to make my case. We yeah. have to see if it makes sense for the company. Does it make sense for me? But uh, to me, agency means uh, I advocate for what I think, what I want to do, but I also accept the, the team's or even my superior's choices as long as I could have made my case and I don't think it's uh, utterly political and stupid which it almost never is so this this agency is a uh, actually what would i feel i need and uh, i i've heard this once in a podcast there was about a, a bike company and uh, people just didn't like their boss so they quit and bought uh, put all their money together bought the building next to the old company and made also a bike shop and uh, they said yeah like their their daily work experience got a lot worse they worked five more hours per day They had to scrub toilets, they had more financial trouble, they had less pay, mm -hmm. but the happiness rating of them, it was a study made on those people, uh, was actually a lot higher. They just cool. were more happy. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, like where this idea I just uh, explained of, of agency over your job came from. And I really feel that's the way my brain works. Other people might be different, but for me, that's... That's the point. I really can't do stuff if I don't believe in it. Then I'm, like, then I'm just the worst employee ever, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one, once you believe in it, then you, you make sure that I, it I scrub done. toilets. No worries. I will scrub toilets if I believe in it. All day. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so no, no job is less, right? All, all jobs no. are important. I also think every job, uh, that's, for example, why we have, uh, as I said in this HR, A questionnaire we have, uh, there's one part uh, that I already mentioned, which is called work ethics. And I think this questionnaire can be applied to every job anybody has, from a cleaning person to a CEO to a monk. Um, that is, those, those are the specific questions we use will be applicable everywhere. And my personal respect to people is highly connected to their work ethic, even as private persons. So if I see by somebody and I always tell people, if they do a great job, maybe the, the cashier at the supermarket, and I just think he, he's friendly, uh, I just tell him and it brings a smile on his face. Or uh, yeah, yeah I just one thing I love most in the world is if people do their job good, in a good way, correctly. And that, that's something I, I think is one of the highest virtue you can have. Do your job in a good way, whatever job you have. And that's what gets you at least my respect and I think a respect of a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, that, that's also the German way of working, right? You you have to, I, I forgot the quote in German, I, I read something somewhere, but it, it's like the mindset, right? That you have to uh, do your job. Uh, I mean, whether you feel like it or not, you have to give uh, your best there. Uh, it's your responsibility, basically. That's that's what it points to, right? Or or am I? I think as something? somebody inside a culture, you never really can say that a thing is a thing, because for me those things are not things because I cannot discern them or separate them from the rest of my culture. So you, as somebody who has also experienced a different culture, probably are more able to say if this is a German thing than I am, because I wouldn't be knowing if it's a German thing. That's that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you you talk about work ethic and working hard in a startup, and you know when you are a small startup that's inspiring to that's aspiring to grow and you know contribute to the society. Working hard would play a really important role. So uh, how what is the mindset that you would 
want or you have uh, uh, the employees have their like uh, do they try to have a balance between their personal life or professional life or you do you follow Elon Musk way of grinding it out uh, what is it like working in a startup yeah so for me personally since it hasn't come up yet but but I'm not even finished with my bachelor's yet I'm just right now doing my thesis so I am actually splitting work and uh, studying or free time, depending on if I have uh, something to do for university still, and that I work uh, three days regularly a week. So I have actually only three work days. Doesn't mean I'm just working three days, but if I need to, I will only work three days. And uh, because of COVID, we have had something that is called Kurzarbeit in Germany, where mm -hmm. you basically reduce working time and for the loss of money, the state covers a huge percentage of it. And a lot of our employees uh, had to do Kurzarbeit. And um, yeah, of course they don't have to work because that would be illegal and we don't want that. But a lot of them took the time to explore professional professional projects inside the company like they have a day off so they try to train a new kind of model for something it's not like a task from work but mm -hmm. they were just interested in it yeah. so i really feel that as a startup you can benefit from implementing work-life balance and there are just times where you everybody has to be all hands on deck seven days a week mm -hmm. and there are times where you just don't need to so you should make the standard from my point of view, um, substantially smaller work week or working time because you're a team, you cover for each other. So if it needs to be more, everybody will be willing to do seven days. But if four days is the standard, it's much easier in the times where you don't really need seven days a week just to work four days, enjoy your Friday. I don't know, go swimming or do a project, uh, whatever you feel like. Um, but to, to get that in society, to get there, you have to make this, from my point of view, the standard. And my experience also now with Kurzarbeit has been that people either can finally take the time to recover from uh, all the hard work they're doing, or they can finally take the time to explore projects they're interested in. So it has almost never been any kind of work work, but sometimes yeah. they just choose uh, on them by themselves to pursue work-related uh, projects which is great because the motivation they have for those projects, uh, I cannot uh, try to imitate that for real tasks. I, I, there's no, no way to get that kind of motivation for a, for a real customer task. Customer calls you and says, oh no, my front end is looking cheeky. I want the, want the color to be blue instead of red. Then <laughs> how, how do I make that as motivating as, wow, I got this idea for new neural network that first transforms yeah. the image like this and then this. Yeah. That, that's just something where you have to make space. Yeah. One very important concept I feel people underestimate is uh, space, space to learn, space to grow. And that is not meaning here's one Friday and you have to learn on that day. Uh, you are at work, but you do a fixed free project or something. That's not how this works. This space idea only works with actual space where you can also in, first in half year. Yes. Not, not like define it as space, but really give people space. Okay. Interesting. And uh, so uh, there are times when you would have to like work very hard. And at that point, probably everyone would be working hard. But uh, at, at times like these, I think, yeah, it makes sense that, you know, you don't add unnecessary work just for the sake of work because yes. uh, you, you can, you know, go at a slower pace and, you know, still be growing and uh, willing to do the things that you uh, want to do and of course i mean even if you're not learning probably taking a break so that you're ready for the next wave or yes. next uh, you know uh, urgent task that you would have to do would also be important so uh, for us yeah. also the the experience of this is you don't see the benefits right now that's why you have to believe in it you have one day off or you say yeah of course you if you worked eight hours a day, you can go home. And yeah. um, nobody, even if he's intentionally willing to work more, will do it on the first day. You have to establish trust, like world, society, company, friends. 
everything works kind of on, on trust and on specific knowledge. You cannot just say, this is the rules. We all follow the rules and that's how it is. You have to establish what does it mean if I work more? What is my valuation in the company? Everything is kind of personal. And then again, my personal bias, I think everything is individual. So yeah. uh, we had employees that for the first half year came at eight and went home at five. And that's okay. That's the thing we demand. And uh, apart from that, we don't demand anything. But then they see that we respect that and that we respect their contribution and are not secretly wanting them to work more because yeah. if they want to go at five, we just expect that. But what ends up happening is if there's something to do, they stay until nine or 10 or however long, but I never have to make them and I wouldn't make them. I'm actually telling them, no, go home. And they say, no, I, I really want to finish this and yeah. I feel comfortable doing so. But that only works if you truly accept that the, the contract you have is, is valid. And if they want to leave at five, they can leave at five. And you can never put that in question. You cannot have this corporate culture where it's secretly still, <laughs> you follow all the rules, but just for ass covering sake. No, if you have a rule, you really have to follow it. So that has to be the highest standard. And the rest no comes politics. on its own. Yeah. I don't like politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, uh, essentially that boils down to the trust that the person has. If the person believes, and also the belief that he's contributing to something bigger than himself, right? And so if he has to stay longer, sometimes he does it because he wants to. And he knows yeah. that it's important. That's Yes. Yeah. That's also really responsibility as a company. Don't tell your employees what's important. Uh, if you tell them what's going on, they will know by themselves. Like they're not stupid. They have master's <laughs> degrees in computer science and they're top 5% at least of society. So mm -hmm. if they don't understand, then maybe you don't understand. <laughs> That's true. And uh, uh, also, uh, since you mentioned COVID and Kursarbeit, how has... Uh, this situation affected business uh, uh, has it affected in any way or yeah of course i think it has yeah. expected uh, affected almost everybody in germany yeah. and uh, for us it means since we're not a big venture capital funded startup mm -hmm. so companies that are venture capital funded have a lot of budget to penetrate a market sell under value develop without having to deliver something for quite some time sometimes. And that is not the company where we are. We are mostly project funded and then a little bit business, business angel investment funded. And uh, so we depend on our contracts. And uh, some of our customers are big uh, German corporates. And there are two things going on with them. Either they have been not so well before and now this is really hitting them hard and they're really struggling to even with all the state funding to continue mm -hmm. and the other more for them positive side of the coin is that some companies are actively using this chance at restructuring so they're getting more lean they're cutting some projects they're using state funding um, which is technically legal and you can discuss it if it's okay to restructure the company um, mm -hmm. We have to see if this is just getting money from the state and using for your own purpose or if it in the end contributes to us as a society because then better companies come over out of it that uh, are good for our society and cannot evaluate that yet. But uh, of both situations, the result is that big corporates, which are a lot of our clients, are not that interested anymore in managing parking spaces. So, for oh. example, our... Um, company clients are not as interested anymore. So the switch, we started with company clients and we slowly turned to smart city and government clients. And now this switch is kind of enforced because the companies don't have any more spending luxury money to equip their parking spots for the sake of their happy employees. But we really yeah. have to go now for the city market because they are not as impacted by COVID because there's a lot of funding projects from the state. So our focus really switches there to, to public infrastructure. So essentially, yeah, that can be really challenging when uh, if, if you had like uh, private companies as your primary clients and then they 
back off suddenly because it's not a priority of theirs because of the situation that we are in uh, but yeah that that changed your direction now you are uh, mostly targeting public areas and i think that in that way also uh, uh, you contribute in a more larger scale right and uh, being uh, available everywhere like uh, the the vision that sona has that that is also more aligned with that right yeah every uh, downside can be a chance right so uh, yeah. life is a series yeah. on ups and downs and uh, in the end it's uh, decisive what you make of it so it can definitely be also a chance for us another chance that it has been for us uh, is uh, home office so from yeah. even before there was like the public assumption that everybody should go to home office i think three weeks earlier we decided as an executive team to um send everybody home basically we said we don't want to take any risk uh, go home we will figure it out uh, we do a home office from now on and uh, yeah we did and um that has helped a lot because two of our founders don't live in aachen anymore they live in cologne and dusseldorf so they could work from home and they had a little bit more time for their families because of uh, they didn't have to travel so much yes. and that was nice um the third founder also lives in aachen and me too and we both mostly do home office which is very uh, good for the way of work we do because i can join any meeting digitally every day mm -hmm. and i have my big setup here at home i can uh, eat more healthy food exercise in between it's really a big upside for home office but um, for example for our developers it was very horrible they were complaining all the time about being lonely wanting to go back for, to the office so then we uh, opened up uh, the office back again and the first only for the developers and now it's basically the developers office it's their office because they're the only ones always there and the rest of us comes in and out as we need there is some space to to extend or use desks uh, we have a little bit smaller office now um yeah so it has enabled us also a little bit to see how we want to work and yeah. uh, we were struggling with having productive home office before now 50 percent of the company is always doing home office and that has enabled us to do things uh, like uh, my girlfriend lives in berlin right now for an internship so uh, i normally wouldn't be able to see her much but i just can go to berlin for two weeks if i know that my work will be sufficient if i do it remotely because right now yeah. i have tested what works what didn't work so i see can i do this the next two weeks or am i needed here and then i can decide to go to berlin for two weeks and also be productive and work every day while still spending time with my loved ones which is uh, very yeah. nice yeah, from from productivity standpoint point uh, home office is definitely better but then yeah there are these caveats that you you'd uh, you you'd probably have to spend time on your own and you'd not be networking or you, you wouldn't be connecting with people essentially so the are you guys also considering uh, uh, to make home office or or you know make it partially more uh, you know a part of the working style or is it something you're still thinking about no it, uh, actually it is so if you want to do home office you can and uh, we have figured out that it is um for the developers it's not a good thing they almost never do it they have the office and i live two minutes from the office so basically for me it is um i get up we have our daily meeting uh, which is digital so we all have a conference video conference 15 minutes at nine o'clock some people are already in office some are almost out of bed and we just discuss what's going on for the day and then um, i have the next meeting which i mostly do at home which is project manager meeting where we just go through all the project plans and see are we still up to date um other tasks that haven't been done so we have to follow up on them so nothing really gets lost or something and um yeah after that uh, i see how my day is going and then i see for example here's a meeting is it necessary that i be there in person then i will just get on my bike and drive there and because it takes two minutes for me and if not, I stay home and work and then I can do things um, that need to be done throughout the day, watering my plants, cleaning up my room in times where I would have to go home from work or something. Um, so it is through COVID an integral part of our working style, um, but it's not home office or office. 
it's uh, really it was a chance to get to know what works and what didn't work mm -hmm. and since we had a very honest and transparent culture everybody could say yeah this worked for me this didn't work me as the hr manager i had a private talk with everybody in the company about their psychological situation for example so i also got a little bit of an overview of how people feel and then we as a company decided to yeah like um, make it optional and uh, a lot of people are using it others don't and uh, now everybody knows what works and what didn't work so we also know certain things where we have to be there and even the people from Cologne and Düsseldorf, they yeah. have to come here for that day. There's just no way around it. But there are other things you can very easily do from home. And um, being forced to learn what works was really a good thing in that situation. Yeah, so you will also uh, take parts of it and keep continuing with it in the future. For example, when it's not urgent, uh, everyone could be working from home. So this COVID situation has fundamentally changed the way people work in a good yeah. way, mostly in a good way, I think. Yeah, yeah I think so and, too. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you uh, tell more about your, uh, what a typical day uh, working at Sona would be? Yeah, so I think it's different for everybody, for me as I choose most of the work myself, it's definitely those uh, two meetings in the morning. So uh, before the first meeting at nine o'clock, I check my notebook. I have a handwritten notebook where I write down what I want to do this week or what I have to do this week. And uh, then we have our daily meeting. Then I have my project manager meeting. And then it really depends on what's going on. So if I am helping out in, in production or technical design or uh, like uh, testing a product or something, then I will go to work and do it. Uh, if it's just, uh, pff, I don't know, I have to update our HR process documentation in the wiki. Of course, I do that from home. And uh, my day is really, uh, I, I can never tell how it's going to go until the day is there because things come up. Uh, I might be at work, I might be not. Uh, I, we have meetings. I personally have a lot of meetings. Uh, gladly, they're mostly on Monday. So Monday, uh, I'm uh, mostly in meetings, uh, different customer uh, evaluations, uh, executive meetings, uh, tactics and strategy meetings, all that is by, for us on Monday. So we have mostly are done for the week then after Monday with those uh, general meetings. Mm -hmm. And then there will, of course, be specific meetings. If I am a project manager for a topic, I will see how is the calendar of my employees? And I will schedule a meeting that fits everybody where we can then discuss what's the status. Can you clarify my questions? Um, but basically I have to decide every day what my day looks like. And uh, except from Monday, which is mostly the same, every day can be different. Yeah. Which, which is what I like. I like the diversity, so to say. Yeah, so every day you, yeah, every day is different and that probably would not be the same when you're working in, a, in an established company, probably. No, I mean, every day. I would day also is... have tasks that I had to do, which I have now, but yeah. I decide that I have to do them. So I just look at the company and look at the projects and I decide this has to be done. So I plan yeah. it for the day to do. Not because it's interesting, but because it has to be done. But it's almost never that somebody tells me, you have to do this tomorrow, but I have to figure it out myself. Yeah, so the, uh, you have a sense of responsibility, but also freedom in choosing uh, what you do, but also, uh, you know, taking into account what is important for the company first. So what, what do you love most about uh, working at Sona? Team. The team is just team. amazing. Okay. I mean, I've selected most of the people that work with me um, and since uh, they have to pass my HR meetings, mm -hmm. uh, I would say there could be definitely a bias towards people I like. Um, but then again, I like everybody. They are just great people. Uh, so I really like the team. Uh, I like everybody in the team, working with them, discussing with them. Uh, so, so this is really, really uh, exemplary good uh, in, our, in our company. 
And what then uh, puts the cherry on the cake is if you have uh, philosophical discussions. So we either try to encourage them when we do like uh, hackathon weekends. Uh, sometimes we rent a house in Belgium here in the Eiffel. Um, um, it's a part uh, like a yeah, very nice part of nature where there's Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany all yeah. share this part of the nature and uh, there you can quite cheaply rent houses. So sometimes we rent a house for a couple of days just go there either for fun or for a hackathon. And that's especially a time where you um, can discuss philosophy, which is great. But it also happens during during the day sometimes. Like somebody, ah, there is a news article X, Y, Z. And then just everybody drops this word, comes to their, <laughs> no, I think this. And the next one is, I think that. And uh, that's just the things I love when you get so much perspectives from so many smart people. And uh, it is it is a bubble and it is uh, it is this um, metaphorical glass house, glass dome where we live in, where we are not confronted with too many other parts of reality. And I really, really like that bubble. I, I love how you you didn't even think uh, a, a moment uh, you know after I asked you the question you said team okay that that's it you were you were very clear on that and that that is like a big indicator on of the uh, environment and the culture that uh, you have at Sona so that's great now let's move on to the last uh, set of questions. Uh, what is your advice for anyone who is uh, considering to work at a startup or maybe he's he's thinking whether he should uh, build his own company, work for a startup or work in a, a bigger company? Maybe someone has like both uh, offers from a startup, from a big company and also has an idea where he could do his own. What would you recommend that person? So my uh, primary life advice I would say is to know what you want. So there are different people, as I said, I'm a strong believer in individuality. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you believe that, you have to believe that uh, you have to find out what you want. Because if you're doing a job you don't really like, but you think it's expected of you either to work in a startup because you think, no, I have to make my own life, but actually I just want to work eight hours a day and spend time with my family, then the startup is not the right life for you. And I, yeah. I completely accept that people have this uh, point of view. It's uh, quite necessary also for society. So the first thing is really find out what you want. And uh, for that, you can try out stuff. Um, second thing is um, don't slave and uh, be uh, expect to be paid back. There is no slaving and accepting and then being paid back in gold. That's just not happening. Yeah. Anyway, it's not happening in a startup. You won't get 50% of the shares just because you worked for 600 euro a month. And that's not happening in university and corporates where you get, uh, I don't know, 6,000 euros for slacking off because you have a master's degree. Um, that, yeah. that thing is just not going to happen. So um, find out what you, what you want to do. And what it is that you want, you want family, you want uh, professional experience, you want to develop, you want to lead a team, you want to hang out with friends uh, and then see what in your life. And that is not only job, but also, I don't know, friends, people you surround yourself that look if it contributes to your idea of your own life. Okay. And uh, then there's one specific recommendation I have for people wanting to start a startup. That is, uh, first thing you have to do is find a customer and sell it to him. Before you write one line of code, the only thing you're allowed to do is PowerPoint. You okay. only do PowerPoint until you have a signed contract for cash. Don't even think then, about the product. Yeah, of course you have to think about the product. You have to do slides. You have to explain what the product is. But then the customer will tell you, oh, I like it that way. Can you do it that way? And since you haven't done anything, you say, yeah, of course. And then you figure out something, a prototype you can build for money that somebody else has paid. Without that, don't even think about starting a company. So, yeah, uh, the first thing is to find a customer. Well, how, how do you find a customer in the first place? Yeah, I think what worked for us in the beginning, and now it's, of course, a lot more professional, but was 
drinking alcohol at <laughs> so you are at a bar perfect startup next... advice huh yeah you, you sit next to a guy who is the blah blah executive of blah blah and um you get into a talk because you're just two guys in a suit sitting at a bar at a conference and um yeah you you talk to him and he say ah, wouldn't it be nice to get this and you say ah oh, technically i have a company who does that do you want to buy it ah. <laughs> and uh, things like that so i think we got um for all of our first customers through personal connections i would not say that the alcohol is a necessity there more of a regular occurrence uh, but that's when people are relaxed and open. So yeah, you just yeah. meet, you have to go to events where corporate and young people mix or people with ideas. And you have to find the right environment where you talk to people out of your bubble. And there you might find somebody who's willing to pay. And then just, um, if he likes you and you like him, there's a personal connection of trust established. This yeah. person is not like, what is your company? What is your revenue stream? He's like, no, I, I like this guy and I trust this guy. Yeah. And uh, since it's mostly not a lot of money, uh, yeah, I just spent the money on it. And uh, yeah, this is again, the concept of individuality and individual and personal trust and connection. Yeah, so going out and meeting people, going to events, connecting with people through personal connections is uh, the best way to get a, a customer. Yes. Yeah. So finally, what are the book recommendations that you have, uh, the books that have had the most impact on shaping your mindset and, you know, uh, that have helped you make the decisions along the way? So um, I only started reading three years ago. I didn't, I wasn't really into books in my earlier adult life. And a lot of the books I've read were more of a um, yeah, novels or something that, that shaped me, but it's more of a psychologically interesting to experience with the character experience. But there are actually two books uh, I want to recommend that have not influenced me throughout my life because I've read them just a couple of years recently or very recently. And the first one, which is my favorite book, which I, um, I buy it all the time, then I lend it to people. And once somebody forgets to give it back, I buy it again and lend it again to people. One time <laughs> I even printed it on a printer and then distributed those because it's just the most amazing and inspirational book for my understanding of modern society. It's uh, only available in Germany, in German, unfortunately. It's called Wer wir waren, Who we've been. Okay. And it's from a German author and uh, television presenter and intellectual actually one of the greatest thinkers of our time, I would say. It's, uh, it would be a person that, like my grandparents, know him from TV, but not my generation. He recently died, and uh, when he wanted to write his final book, it was um, an account of today and the future. And then he died before he could finish the book, but he did make one speech to that topic. And this speech is printed as a book now, and to me it's the most influential um, text I've uh, read in my life and I read it so many times and I've bought it so many times uh, the book already distributed it to friends and family and um, the, the concept where the name comes from is uh, I think very interesting because um, it basically means that today in a situation where a person is he does not think about uh, his actions in terms of who will I become? Who will I be? What do I stand for? But already at this point, before I act, what will be the perception of other people retrospectively of what I did? That's why he said who we've been. And he's fundamentally criticizing this self-display, which hinders us to do real progress, real development where you just okay. already think of, okay, I will do this. So then in an even further future, people will perceive me like this because I will have done that. And that's wow. just not the way to think. And there is uh, actually listened to it the first time as an audiobook, And I had to stop every, every 30 seconds just to think about the sentences. Then I bought it as a book and it's uh, just amazing. I actually translated one, the best part of it to English, I can send it to you after the podcast if you're interested. Yeah, sure. 
And uh, yeah, this this book is just um, it really defines my philosophy on life, technology, and society. And then uh, one book which is uh, different, uh, which I just recently finished, is the invention of yesterday. It's uh, I think everybody knows um, Homo Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Yeah. So worldwide known book and it's basically the same book but Harari is really focusing on technological advances uh, that have happened or um, specific events that have shaped society afterwards whereas the invention of yesterday focuses on social constellations so what social constellations did exist at a time how did they trickle to each other how did they mingle and become something new what was their perception of life and why did that, for example, make them uh, what they were? How did, we, how did we get here? And what I find most amazing about the book is how, how connected world history seems to you after reading it. Like after reading Homo sapiens, um, the way the world is seems kind of inevitable or as a step of steps, uh, one thing after another one. But yeah. after the invention of yesterday, the whole world feels like you have all these interconnections in your in your mind of how the world became to be what it is. And the most amazing thing is then in the end, there are two chapters that describe why the world currently is as it is. And that has especially, um, that was amazing to me because writing a history book and then in the end, making substantially interesting uh, assumptions about this time where we are now that that is not the um uh, not the task a historian has there's actually a completely different book yeah and it's only a couple of chapters but to fit that thing so fittingly with all of the world history in the same book uh, was really amazing to me the invention of yesterday right yes yes okay. the invention of yesterday Interesting book recommendation. So, uh, you, you seem to be a person who is a deep thinker and you, uh, you also enjoy philosophy. So I, I'll just put one more question to uh, end our conversation. What do you think is the meaning of life? To be happy. <laughs> Re really, that's, that's yeah, what no, you really. think. Mm -hmm. I think if everybody focuses on being happy and I, I expect in an ideal situation, you cannot be happy while other people suffer. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look out for yourself, you will also look out for other people, for yourself. It's this concept of egoistic altruism and altruistic egoism. I don't know the English word for it. I think you can imagine. And those are two concepts that define this. Mm -hmm. But if you have to boil it down to one sentence, the meaning of life is to be happy. Okay, but uh, uh, there must be times in your work that you wouldn't be, you know, happily doing it. Definitely, I can imagine a lot of stressful times and you wouldn't call the, uh, the thing that you would be experiencing at that point as happiness. And if you have happiness as your priority, probably you'd be like, fuck that. I'd be uh, we're doing things that I want to do that make no, me happy. Right? That's not the happiness I mean. The happiness I mean is more of a deep life satisfaction and long term you, yeah not long term i mean if i am doing something stupid even when i'm annoyed even when i'm angry yeah. i am to a certain extent happy and if i am not that means the stupid thing i'm doing is really stupid not necessarily stupid yeah. but it uh, doesn't help anybody or something then i know then then i feel them not at all a little bit happy about what i'm doing then I know, okay, I have to change something. But then also happiness, and I, I just recently read a graph. I didn't read the study to the graph, to be honest. But uh, the graph showed how the perception of, uh, how the happiness of people differs from people who think they can influence the happiness. People who think they can influence the happiness are substantially happier than people who think they don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've suffered in my youth uh, from depression for quite a time. And uh, to me, um conquering that was um, something that made me and my personality because I had to learn how to be happy and how to behave to be a happy person, how to deal with every situation. 
And so for me, this was a chance uh, to, to, to see life a different way. And uh, one thing I learned from that is it's not that hard to be happy. And you can actually, to the most part, influence that you're happy, no matter what comes your way. So, so essentially what you mean by happiness is fulfillment, right? Uh, something that is fulfilling you and also making you happy as, as a consequence of it. I mean, you're focusing practically on fulfillment, but the feeling you get from that is happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite uh, concisely put, I would say. <laughs> so with this, I'd just like to uh, conclude the talk. It was a pleasure to talk to you. We talked about various different things that I didn't even uh, plan off. And uh, so we, we talked about your uh, background in education and how you uh, participated in robotics competitions and how uh, your experiences in the past gave you a specific skill set that you now apply at Sona, your experience at Sona and uh, uh, all, all the other uh, ideologies that you have uh, about life, about data processing and all these things. So it was truly a pleasure and I think uh, we can still have another talk in the future. We, I'll add more philosophical questions uh, <laughs> this time and we can have another conversation if you'd like to. So yeah, I think I thoroughly enjoyed this and Thank you yeah. for being on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. I have been looking forward to it the last couple of days and I really enjoyed it too. Thank you so much for also giving me this opportunity to put my thoughts out there. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. It was a fun conversation.